Let me share my screen with y'all. All right. Let me share my screen with y'all. And then I can. I think that's the one I want to share. Yeah. Can you all see something? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Awesome. That works for me. Lovely. Moving you on to the middle here. Excellent. All right. So as Debbie laid out, I am, in fact, John Bracey. I am from Massachusetts, and I have been teaching for about a decade or so. I currently teach at Belmont High School. I also taught middle school for about eight years in a little town called Weston. Uh, I spent a year in Belchertown, you know, all around Massachusetts. I've been kind of teaching, but I've, I've settled in, in, uh, in Belmont. So I've been at this for a little while. Now, um, so once again, I am a uh, middle and high school teacher primarily. So my trade is teaching. So everything that I will talk about and show you today is going to be focused on what you can do in terms of teaching. Because from my perspective, a lot of where our issues are have to do with the way that we are approaching teaching in its totality. And that that is the place where a lot of our issues are showing up and a place where we can make immediate, concrete, effective changes straight out the gate. So if you're willing to go on this journey with me, I'll show you what I do. I'll show you what I've seen work and I'll show you how to do it. All right, let's get it. Break the walls down. All right, let's do this. Awesome. So I like to start off with what our goal is going to be uh, for this talk ultimately. Now, regardless of what level it is that you teach, regardless of what language you teach, it does not matter. This is going to be our objective and this is going to be the marker of our success. We would like our programs to resemble the full demographics of our schools throughout all levels. Programs to resemble the full demographics of our schools throughout all levels. I repeat, this is what we're aiming for. And when we get here, we know we're on the right track. Next part. I do this with all my presentations. I like to start off with action steps. I like to lay out what exactly it is that we're gonna try to do, what you're gonna be able to do at the end of this and what actual concrete steps you can take like now to make this kind of a difference. So these are gonna be the first steps that I'm going to recommend. One, shift your focus to comprehension. Two, Adopt more inclusive assessment and grading practices. Three, establish accessible goals and expectations. These are your first steps. This is where we are losing people. This is what's making our programs homogenous. Let me show you what comes next. All right. Comprehension, comprehension, comprehension-based teaching. This is how this works. If they read or hear something, they understand you have succeeded, just as Debbie mentioned in the very beginning, right? This is based on the research, of course, of Dr. Stephen Krashen, who is the, um, the second language acquisition researcher who came up with the concept. And as far as we know, this is the only way that languages are acquired at its fundamental core. When we hear things or read things that we understand. That's it. It's really that simple. Isn't that nice? Easy. So which means that we want to shift the focus of our courses, of our programs, to reading and listening with some requirements. 
everything that your students read, everything that your students hear, they must understand. How does that happen? We do that. We make sure that everything that we say, we make sure that everything that they read, they understand. That's our job. It's not their job to figure out what it is that we are saying or what it is that they're reading. Our job is to make it understandable because none of this stuff happens in our brain that leads to us understanding languages or learning languages, as it were, until we understand. So everything before that doesn't really do much. After that is where all the good stuff happens. Now, the reason why I am focusing on this right now is because this works for everyone. It's designed to work with the human brain. Languages are not intellectual. It has nothing to do with memory. It has nothing to do with work ethic. It has nothing to do with anything other than the language processors in your brain. If you are able to understand any language, I'm pretty good at English. That means that my language system works. If that works, there are no barriers to language acquisition. Everyone can make progress. That's why I focus on this because this can work for absolutely everybody. And that is the only reason why I advocate for it. All right. So again, everything must be understood by the reader and listener. Everything must be designed to communicate. No random, I know, I know. No random lists. No more of the, no more of the, uh, ah, yes, I took Spanish for 10 years. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete. We're ending that. That conversation is not going to happen anymore. No parents are going to come to you at back to school night and be like, oh, I took Spanish for 10 years or I took Latin for 10 years. I don't know anything other than Puella, Puella. No, we're ditching all that. Everything must be designed to communicate. Everything we say, everything we give them to read is going to have a communicative purpose, right? The only reason why language exists is so that we can communicate. So we are only going to use it for communication. This is going to become the new focus of what we do, reading and listening. Let's start with a little bit of language, shall we? All right. I have a chunk of Latin here. I'll read it to you very quickly. I'll tell you what it means, and then you'll see what it means in a second, in case Latin's not your first language or second. It's not mine. It's my, I don't know which one it is, my third, fourth. I don't know. I don't know. But it's in there, though. All right. So here we have a little mini paragraph. It says, in medium eris donum pasuit. Donum malum erat. In malo verba erant. Da me pulcherimai. Omnes dei malum Wo Levant. Ha! Ah, so here is a random chunk of Latin from a little story. In its current form, we've done nothing with it. It's just a series of words that you may or may not understand. So our job is to make this understandable. Here's how we do that. Step one, we establish meaning. Now, this sounds like it's complicated or like a fancy idea, the establishment of meaning. I am going to demonstrate to you how to establish the meaning of something. Because once again, nothing happens until everyone understands. Here's how you do it. <clears throat> in the medium means into the middle. There, I did it. I have it written up here on the slide so you can see it. If I'm in an in-person classroom, 
it'll just be written on a whiteboard somewhere virtually it's written on a slide wherever it can be so that kids students adults whoever they happen to be can see it the entire time it never goes away i write it in the target language and i write it in whatever the common languages are in your class right so if i'm in a classroom and half of the kids um have urdu as like their family language i might write it in urdu in addition to english it's whatever language the students are most comfortable with that's what we use to establish meaning there's no dancing around there's no like uh there's no putting on a puppet show to try to communicate that medium means middle you don't need to do that you just need to say what it means and then right up there in medium into the middle Ooh, that was like two seconds. That's it. There's nothing more to it than that. The way we get people to understand what something means is by telling them what it means. Otherwise, how would they know? So down here, I have the translation, which I'll read aloud. To the story, we have Eris placed the gift into the middle. The gift was an apple. There were words on the apple. Give me to the most beautiful. All the goddesses wanted the apple. Right? It is communicative because it is a story. All the sentences are connected to tell the beginning of a story. And very important, not random disconnected sentences. Good. And once again, anything that I think is not known I put up here. Now, say that a student raises their hand and says, I don't know what erat means. That word there, E-R-A-T, erat. I don't know what that means. Here's how you handle that situation. Oh, erat means was. And then I'll just write erat equals was on there with the other words. And then it'll stay up there for the whole class. That's it. Pretty easy, no? And you wanna leave it written up there the entire time because part of where we lose people is in a traditional language classroom, like a lot of us, you know, the way that a lot of us were taught and what a lot of us are used to doing is there's this heavy emphasis on memorization. And what happens is, is people memorize things and then they forget them. Because I mean, language is actually not connected to the memory. So you memorize things and you forget them. But then what we tend to do is say, well, well we covered Erot and uh, a year ago. You should know what that means. How do you not know what that means? You need to work harder. And so as a result, we leave a lot of kids behind. And so when it is up there the entire time, if someone has attentional difficulties, like I do, and you drift off and you come back and say, oh, my goodness, what's going on? What are we talking about? Okay, it's just right there. So I can always re-engage. So this will allow everybody the entire time to follow what's happening so that we don't lose anybody. And I mean, we don't lose anybody. All right. I'll speed you through a couple techniques. You're going to get a copy of this, so you'll be able to look at it more in depth. But these are just to give you examples of things that one can do with this. So all of these in the category of pre-reading. So things you're doing to prepare kids to read something, right? For example, throw up some interesting pictures. Talk about them in the target language using the words or phrases that are gonna be new to the students. And lo and behold, all the words are still there that are gonna be used, all there with their with their target language form and the common language form so that there is no confusion about meaning. Now, one reason why I recommend this as opposed to um, what a lot of training will say is we'll never, ever, never use the first language ever. You must always stay in the target language. Or if you're in Latin, they, they, it's more like you must never use the target language ever. But in most language classes, it's like, you can't ever use English. You can't ever do it. Don't you do it. 
So the problem is, is that then people will use things like pictures and pictures are wonderful, right? But for example, um, say you have a picture of someone holding a glass of water like this and drinking. Imagine you just screenshotted me right here. What is the word? Say I say the word aqua. Aqua is the Latin word for water. Fun, right? Aqua. So I say aqua. And I show them that picture of me drinking a glass of water. And I think, perfect, this is great. So is the glass the aqua? Is the, wa is the water the aqua? Am I aqua? Is like, what is, what is aqua? This makes sure that nobody gets left behind. There's no confusion. Because when we get the confusion, that's where we lose people. And we don't lose people. But that's just this quick example. Other thing that we can do um, along these lines is something called um, tiered reading, where you just simply you take a story, like the one we have there, and you create a simplified version of it. So I've taken here, you see, I've taken the full version of the story, which is at the bottom there. And on top, I created a slightly simpler version with fewer words, but that communicates the same idea, just with some details missing. This is to um, create an ease in point, right? Kind of like a ramp into the story. And that will come back later. But again, the idea underpinning all of this is that we are adjusting what we do to make it work for our students. That is the undercurrent here. Again, these are activities you'll be able to play with. I'll give them to you and show you how to do them. But in the time we have, I want to just give you the main ideas so you kind of know where we're going. So again, the main point of that last bit was to introduce you to the idea or reinforce the idea that focusing on comprehension, focusing on teaching a language in the way that the brain naturally wants to acquire languages, that works for everyone. And if our goal is to make in this case, Latin, or whatever language we teach, accessible to everyone. I've not found another way to do it, at least in terms of like a teaching approach. If I do, I will drop that in a heartbeat and go on to that. Literally, the only reason why I, I do that is because of the goal of making it accessible to everyone. If it didn't do that, I would stop right now. And if I found something better, I'd move on to that because that's where our focus is, right? All right, let's move to the next step. Now, this is enormous. I was just having this conversation the other day. Inclusive assessment and grading practices. No one fails. And I do mean no one fails. Everyone makes progress. It's assessments. It's grading. We have the power so much of the time to decide what our assessments are and how we would like to grade. These decisions, these decisions are what have kept entire languages almost exclusively white for generations at this point. I mean, there's a reason why, like, if you say, you know, the black Latin teacher, they're probably talking about me like, wherever you are, because I'm like literally the only black guy who like made it through. There's like there's like a couple of us scattered around the country. I think I can name them all. I think I literally can name the individuals of us. So this is where I believe a lot of the problem has been. So let's take a quick look here. All right. Assessment. Once again, comprehension based. What we teach is what we assess. Everything is always in context. So that means, and this may be painful to hear and was painful for me to hear and took me a while to get used to it, but yeah, it's, it's, it's time to start hacking away the charts. It's time to take that declension chart or that verb conjugation chart. And I'm not saying to set fire to your whole world now, I'm saying take one of them and be like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it over here for now. 
I'm just going to do one less of those today at whatever pace you feel comfortable with. But we're moving in a, to a system that's going to allow everything to be in context when we assess it so that there are always ways for people to connect to what's happening. This is absolutely critical. Our assessments are designed for all students to succeed. We assess when we think all of our students will succeed. We design that assessment specifically to capture what we think the kids are able to do at that point in time. That is the goal. These assessments, ultimately, if we get back to the core of what an assessment is supposed to be, it's not meant to be about the students. It's not meant to be like an evaluation or a rating for them. What it's meant to be is information for us to determine um, where the kids are at or where the students are at, what's working, what isn't, what we need to do more of. It's just meant to be information for us as teachers to adjust. So these things are for information, not for punishment or reward. Neither of those things. This is going to be critical, this mental reframe right here, because it is in this system of punishments and rewards that we somehow miraculously get through happenstance. End up rewarding the same people all the time. And we end up punishing the same people all the time. So that somehow, when we get to those upper level classes, it seems like it's the same people, the same demographics every single time. There's something going on here. Right. Here are a couple of just quick examples of what an assessment that is more equitable could look like. And again, these are, are very um, pared down examples of what they could be, right? Just for demonstration purposes. So here's a very simple assessment right here. Comprehension questions. The goal is to understand, right? Right, if we teach a language, we want people to understand the language. No, isn't that a common goal we have? Isn't that the point? Isn't that the exciting part? Like, hey, they understand. This person didn't understand it, now they do. That's exciting. That's why I do it. It's, it's, it's wonderful, right? So let's assess that. So comprehension questions. Simple. One thing to notice is notice that they're in English and not in the target language. I do this for a reason, because again, we're not trying to assess anything other than do they understand. If I ask the questions in Latin, I run into two issues. One, they might not understand the question. They may understand the, they may have perfect comprehension of the reading, but they might not have perfect comprehension of the question. So I will get muddy information. I might not know if it's that they don't, they can't read the story or that they can't read the question. Two is another kind of dirty secret. Um, when you ask questions in the target language and you ask for answers in the target language, I mean, let's let the cat out of the bag on this one. You don't need to know what anything says to answer that question, do you? No, you find you find the sentence that has those words in it and you find what's missing and then you just put that in and that's the answer. I, 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 I faked my way through a number of classes pulling that trick. So it just gives me muddy information that's not useful to me. So that's what we wanna know. Do you understand it? Do you know what happened? This is a clean, easy way to do it, right? It seems simplistic, works at all levels. And for those of you who like oldies but goodies, I'm letting you keep translation, but, but there's a huge but here. I'm letting you keep it, but you have to promise me 
that you're not going to use it um, to gain understanding. You're using it only for assessment purposes. Only for assessment purposes when you're convinced that they definitely already know what it means. So as an assessment, right? Pick a couple of these sentences, pick four out of five of them and just say what they mean. That's it. It's that simple. Now, I'll throw one more at you. So this story is written in the past tense. I do not care if the students translate this and they say is instead of was. It makes absolutely no difference to me. Because if you notice, the entire story is in the the entire story is in the past tense. It exists basically in one linear time frame, right? So is, was makes no difference to comprehension whatsoever. If I change everything to present tense, it would be the same story. Everything would happen in the same order. No understanding is lost. They understand the story. Huge thing that you want to do as well is notice how there's choice. Um, I'm so sorry, prof Professor. Yes. I just want to ask you, like, are you speaking because of like the grading practices or just so case in the same time it's in Latin or this is a Latin uh, uh, PowerPoint? Oh, no, this is so this would be an assessment by itself. So say we already worked with this story before. Uh -huh. And so what we would do is then say we worked with it. We talked about it. We did all of the things prior. Mm -hmm. Then what we would do is then as an assessment that I would give them, mm -hmm. typically unannounced, just when it seems like everybody kind of gets it, uh -huh. what I do is I give them this the story exactly as they had it before and say, okay. all right, here it is. Pick four of the five sentences, whichever ones you want, and then just write down what they mean. Oh. And then I'll grade it and count it as an assessment. So, so basically you're using Latin to, to teach us how to do an assessment or how to, how to grade people, huh? Exactly, exactly. Okay. You got yeah, it, Jeremy. Yeah, right. oh, no, I'm, just, I'm just curious because I thought you're teaching about Latin because I don't understand any of that. But oh, yeah, if you're talking you. about a grading practice, then it's easier to understand because you're just using the Latin as an example for, for the whole paragraph. Yes, yes, yes. And I want to make that clear too. If I go back real quick, you know where it says, so earlier on, I focus, I, I read out like what it means, but you're going to get a mm. copy of this. And so you're going to be able okay. to have that, what it means there too. So when you go through it, you're going to be able to see the example still. That's cool. And so that, so then you'll be able to apply it to whatever language you teach. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, definitely. hundred percent. All right. I appreciate it, Jeremy. I appreciate it. No, it's cool. It's cool. I, I just, I, I was confused. So I had to ask you, thank you though. No, that's so again. So I want to, I want to point out something that is, I think super important. So I, I thank you, Jeremy. So that is a practice that occurs in my classes. So what Jeremy did is he asked for clarification. He asked for understanding. I don't always know if I'm being understandable, right? The only way I know if I'm being understandable is if everyone understands, right? And so, so I can't read minds. Jeremy was kind enough to be like, hey, I don't quite understand what's going on here. Can you clarify? And then my response is to clarify. In it. Yeah, it's that simple. So having that open line of communication with your students will allow you to know exactly when you are being comprehended or not. And there's no punishments and no rewards on either end of it. Does that make sense? Excellent. Okay, I love it. I actually, I really do appreciate that. So, awesome. Other things you can do with it. Again, you can do something simple like a listen and draw where you just read a, the same story and you have people draw a picture. It works in elementary, works in middle, high school, university. It works with adults. It does not matter. It is one of the easiest and fastest ways to understand if someone gets something or not. A simple path to understanding. There's no barrier. They're reading something and they're showing you the image that's in their head. I am the world's worst artist. I can barely write my name legibly. So this kind of assessment would be like, give me a stick figure with labels. Cause that's all I can do. 
But again, this gets at what we actually want to know with no extraneous stuff. Did you understand it? Again, another simple format, true or false, anything like that works. But the kind of assessment you give is going to be, of course, tied to your system of grading. If you want your program to reflect the full demographics of your school, you're going to have to change the way that you grade. These are the fundamentals here. No failure. No body fails. How do you do that? You just don't. You don't write F in the grade book. You don't give them a zero in the grade book. You don't give anybody an F. Sounds nuts. Here's the rationale behind it. As a former F student myself, um, there is nothing motivating about failure. There's no one, no one here is going to leave this, uh, this talk and then think, find something that they're truly awful at and spend the next hour like, ah, before I go to bed, I'm going to do something I'm terrible at. I'm going to draw. I'm going to sing. Do a little singing. Do something I stink at. No, no one wants to do things that they stink at or they feel like they're awful at. Failure is not motivating. On um, the only time, it, the only time, I mean, in terms of like the behavioral research on this stuff, the only time it is even partially motivating is if you are successful the overwhelming majority of time and have that one slip up that says, "Okay, I got to refocus." But when you hit that F, done. And again, we're language teachers. When someone's done. They're gone. They leave. Who does that benefit? The answer is nobody. We had someone who came to our class wanting to learn something from us, and we showed them the door. They wanted to learn something, they didn't get to learn it, and then they had to leave. We have fewer students. And we live with the fact that we just denied someone access to an entire subject, in this case, to an entire language, entire culture. We said, not good enough. No one benefits from it. No one wins. We are teachers, right? Our job is to teach people stuff. It's not our job to simply evaluate people. Our job is to teach people things. And if, they, if what we're doing isn't working, we have to change. Quite simple. We don't fail anybody. Another thing that'll help you too is the next thing on that list there is the 80-80 rule. Now listen to this one. 80%. If 80% of the students in one of my classes get an 80% or better on one of those assessments, I keep that assessment. I put it in the grade book. If 80% of my students do not get an 80% or better, say 70% get an 80% or better, I throw it out. I throw it out. I learned what I need to learn from it, which is that, oh, in general, we weren't there yet. Okay. So... There's some things we got to do. We got to read another story. We got to talk a bit more. We got to give them more input. And then we'll try again. That's it. Simple, no? Again, try. Try only grading comprehension. Do they understand? Try only grading if they understand. And the two that I think are the ones that are most explicitly connected to race and class inequality would be homework. So my position on homework is that I have not assigned homework in five, six years. I stopped. I stopped doing it. Particularly at the K through 12 level, I stopped. 
Why? Because I did a lot of reading on this and from someone who never did their homework um, <laughs> early on in my life there, I learned some things. One is that whether or not you complete your homework has almost nothing to do with you. For those of us who've, you know, who've ever been in that meeting, you know, in that meeting when you talk about a kid who's struggling, after like my hundredth meeting of that, I would walk in before I would even know what the meeting was about. And I'd say, say we're going to talk about a kid who's struggling. And I'll say, and I walk in and say, all right, so is the kid black? Is the kid um, on an IEP or both? Every time the list of kids who are struggling, Hey, black kid, black kid, black kid, black kid with an IP, black with an IP, IP, black kid. So it's literally all we were doing were just punishing kids who had neurological differences and students of color. And then all of the students who always did their homework, guess what? They were like, it was mostly white kids and people who had, um, were neurotypical and had very particular types of home life. Or as I can attest to, they're willing to drop like, a hundred bucks an hour on a tutor to just sit there and watch them do homework. I know because I, I done taken that money before. I'm, I, I, I will admit it. I have taken that money before I have, I have taken a hundred dollars and sat there and watched a kid do their Latin homework before. And I waved to the tutor who walked out the door when I walked in and I greeted the next tutor that came in when I walked out. Whether people complete their homework or not has nothing to do with them. So I don't assign it. I would recommend that if you do assign it, don't grade it or make it so that you cannot succeed unless you do the homework. Class time is the time you have. And of course, the one that I tie most to race, to race stuff would be the bell curve. The bell curve. When you tie your grades to a preconceived idea of a scale of where people are going to be, there's going to be X number of this, X number of that, X number of that. If you are on the higher end, you'll be here. And then everyone will be judged based on that top there. So you get a lovely little bell curve. Okay, so this is wonderfully racist and the kind of thing that will kill your program overnight. So. Do not walk into your class and expect to see uh, three or four A's. There's going to be some B's in there. A lot of C's. I'm going to throw some of those in there. And I don't want to look like the easy teacher, so I'm just going to take a kid and flunk them. No, we don't do that. If every, single, if every single kid gets an A in my class, I feel like I've won. That's a victory. Everyone gets an A, I won. There's nothing to be gained from being the person who just likes, is basically just a sadist, right? Again, we're teachers. If you went to like, if you signed up for like dance classes, right? If you signed up for salsa dancing, you imagine you signed up for salsa dancing. You show up there the, uh, the you know, the first day and then someone's like, oh yeah, I want to be a salsa dancer. Okay. Um, memorize all different bones in the foot and then come back tomorrow. And like, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with the, the whole foot thing. It's like, well, it's not fair to the people who really studied the foot stuff. So get out. You're never going to dance. You're not a dancer. Get out of here. No, we're not doing that. We are teachers. Our job is to teach people things. Not to determine who will make our lives easier or more difficult. And where I'm going to end today before we get to the questions is with accessible goals and expectations, which ties the last thing there. The reality is that we pull a lot of our expectations out of nether regions. A lot of the stuff we just made up, pulled out of nowhere, it's fairy dust, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's just, I think that this is worth X points and that's worth that points. And that's, it's arbitrary, but the results are real. And the results have been rampant, nonstop inequality for, as, I mean, at least my lifetime, I'm assuming much further back than that. Accessible goals and expectations, build ramps, not staircases. 
This is where I'm going to take you. I'm going to take you right to there. Now we'll stay here. Ramps, not staircases is where I want to leave you because I think this is going to capture the concept of accessible goals and expectations and let you begin the real work of being able to reevaluate how you do things. Ramps versus staircases. Imagine you have a building. That building has a staircase. The only way to get into that building is by walking up that flight of stairs. Can everyone get into that building? The answer is no, not everybody can get into that building. Whatever's going on in the building might as well not even be going on in there for the people who aren't able to walk up those stairs. And in the positions we have, particularly as language teachers, where people don't watch us as closely, we can make that staircase super narrow. We can make it have hundreds of steps so that by the time someone's able to get up there, it's only the fittest of the fit, the elite of the elite are the only ones who can get up there. And so we can sit there in our little program with our little super kids and I'll come into class and I'll tell a dad joke and they'll all laugh. And they'll be, <laughs> They're all doing wonderfully. I must be great at this. And it's tempting to do. It's tempting to do because it does stroke our egos. We like it. But we have to recognize that it's not real. What if I got rid of that staircase and replaced it with a ramp? Everyone can get into the building. Guess what? The people who could get up that staircase, they can still get in the building. But now so can everybody else. Everybody else can also get into that building. That's how we want to think about our expectations when it comes to our programs and into our classes, right? If our expectations only serve the function of weeding out the kids that, I mean, quite frankly, we just kind of decide that would be too difficult for us to teach. And that's what, that's what, that's what it is. When we have the ramp, then everybody gets in. And you know what? It can be a little bit harder, but it's worth it because everybody gets in. And as somebody who found myself crawling up a whole bunch of staircases. I got to the top and I wasn't proud. I got to the top of that staircase. I wasn't like, yes, got here. Yeah, take that, losers. I got up here. No, and none of us think that way. That's not who we are. None of us are like that. So when I say break the walls down, I mean break the walls down. When you, all of us got to the top of that weird staircase, that's our job to tear that staircase down and replace it with a ramp. We're kicking those doors open and we're letting everybody in. We're breaking the walls down and we are breaching this entire field. And everybody who was being barred from entry before, they're all running in at the same time. That's what we're here to do. We have the power to do that by adjusting the way that we teach, the way that we assess, and the way that we grade. This stuff I've already covered. I wanna bring us back to our first steps. Shift your focus to comprehension. Adopt more inclusive assessment and grading practices. Establish accessible goals and expectations. You will know that your goals and expectations are accessible when everyone is accessing them. That's how you know. The way you'll know that this has worked long-term is when someone can, and this particularly applies to Latin teachers, I will say, if someone can walk into your classroom Look at the students 
and not be able to tell what language that class is just by looking at the students. That's when you know you have succeeded as a program. And that's what I leave you with. These steps right here. But one final caveat, it is COVID year and everything is crazy and everything's insane and life is all crazy and messed up and everything is just a huge disastrous mess of everything. Um, be very, 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 very kind to yourself and don't punch yourself in the face if you're like, oh, I can't do all this stuff right now. If you wake up breathing, you have won this year. These are things to keep in your mind as you work further towards this. This isn't like tomorrow I have to have all this done. Think of one thing that you can change this year, if that. But again, if you wake up breathing, you won this year. I'll leave you with that. Thanks for having me and thanks for letting me talk to you. All right, this was so great. Thank you so much, John. There's so much for a lot of us to think about, um, you know, whether it has to do with language instruction um, or anything really about the importance of accessibility, the importance of inclusivity and the ways that we can break the walls down. You know, John obviously talked about it in terms of uh, Latin instruction or language instruction, right? But there are lessons here for all of us. So I wanna open this up now for Q&A. You're welcome to post your questions in the chat. Um, but I wanna start with a question that we have from Elise, um, which is that on the point of defining words in the first language, I'm on board with that, but my department is strongly against even a word of English. How can I defend this theory and get them off my back? Aha. So I happen to have spent the first several years of my career working in probably, probably the most hostile possible environment to literally any of the things that I talked about in this speech. So I've been there. So fortunately right now I work in probably the best possible scenario. So I'm very lucky. So here's what you want to find out. All right, so your department is against this. They want you to not use English at all, right? They're like 100% immersioners. Okay. How often do they come to your classroom? Do Does your department head or your superior or whoever the person evaluates you determines whether you get hired or fired or whatever have you? Where is that? How often does that person come to your room? Do they like you? Do you have a good relationship with them? Do you have colleagues that are potentially uh, not thrilled with you or colleagues you have a good working relationship with? So all of this that I'm saying is that you want to find out exactly how actively against this they are. Like, are they actually going to take action against you? So what I would consider is if you're not facing like active opposition, I wouldn't necessarily try to even bring up the theory behind it. I would just do it. And then if someone says something like, oh, hey, you're using English there. Like, huh? oh, oh yeah, I was using that as an example. Um, and then they're like, uh, well, it would be better if you didn't use English. Like, oh yeah, no, that makes sense. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know you're right. I got to sometimes I fall back on it. I got to stick. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And then kind of still do it, but maybe be a little bit less obvious about it. <laughs> but what I will advise against is if you start conversations with about theory with people, I find that more often than not, they will end up being more against you at in the end than they were in the beginning. People tend to get kind of defensive. I think we all are like that. So what I would do is if no one's on your back, I would do it anyway. And then maybe casually bring it up. Some mentions is, oh yeah, yeah. I found that sometimes the pictures are a little confusing. Like they can't tell if it's water or if it's the cup. So for things like that, I'll just write, oh, it's the cup. Just so that there's no confusion from an equity standpoint, because you know, people have a, like, there's a, a lot of different kinds of people in the room and not everybody's gonna pick up on that, right? But yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start I wouldn't start like a whole like debate about it because yeah, people can get defensive about it. So that would be my advice. That's great. We have another question asking if you have any favorite warm-ups for students to start thinking in Latin. Ooh, 
warm ups. Warm ups are fun. So yeah, one thing that I like to do is ooh, what's a fun one? Um, just pick a kid, pick a student, any student in your class. Doesn't matter if you teach kids, adults, doesn't matter who they are. Pick someone in the class and notice something about them. Maybe as they're walking in, be like, uh, hey, like, I noticed that your shoe game is on point. Like, like, are you into sneakers and whatnot? Like, should I get those? And then, like, when then you know, we have a little conversation, then class starts. And then you start the class off that way as like sort of a warm up. Be like, you know, like in, in Latin, you know, you'd be uh, I'll just say it in English so that I don't lose anybody. So you'd be like, class, like Bobo is wearing nice shoes. Bobo's shoes are nicer than my shoes. Class, should Bobo give me his shoes? And you start going on as long as you can go until it gets boring. But you just start a conversation in the target language about something to do with one of the kids, one of the students in the class. That's my favorite kind of warm up. It's spontaneous and easy to, to, to get going. But if you want something that's more, um, that's less improvisational, Find a ridiculous picture, just like Google dumb pictures, or just like scroll through like Instagram to find something weird looking, and just put up a picture of just something that's bizarre, and then do a little picture talk on it, where you talk about what's going on in there in the target language. Of course, with all the stuff written on the board and all like the scaffolding and everything you need to make sure it's all understandable. But that's a fun one. It's, it's any sort of visual anchor to like, you know, keep the conversation exciting. But of course, you can keep it going as long as it's interesting, but definitely bail out if it gets boring. The moment it gets dull, don't force it. Just stop. That's great. We have a question from Andrew Carroll. What is the average length of time you spend with a specific story in terms of 50-minute time periods? So you do sort of three 50-minute classes, six 50-minute classes with a story. Ah, with like an individual story that size? What's good, Andrew? Andrew Carroll. I love Andrew Carroll. If you don't have Andrew Carroll, Andrew Carroll is legend. He can wear shorts in a in the coldest of temperatures. But I love I love Andrew Carroll. But yeah, so it depends entirely on the story. If it's an easier story to understand, I'll or it's not that interesting. We'll just read it once and then boop, it could be literally just one class period. It could be half of a class period. If it's longer, more involved or more interesting content wise, and there seems to be like a lot of things that the that the students are latching onto, then I might have it go as long as it's interesting. So that might be a that might be two class periods or three class periods, um, depending on if there's enough stuff to go off of. But what I've been working on a lot of a lot, because something that I that I struggled with before is like is really beating the horse to death. Like Sometimes you just read a story and that's it. Like, that was a fun story. Anyhow, moving on. Like, sometimes you don't really need to do anything with it. But then, you know, sometimes there's interesting topics and whatnot, or like it, it brings up something cultural or something that sends you off in a different direction. So it really depends. But I say I err towards not wanting to spend too much time with an individual story. The point where it gets repetitive. So if I'm reading a story that's like one page, probably one class period, maybe part of a second one. But I try I try my hardest not to drag it. I hope that helps. And I love Andrew Carroll. Yeah, we also have another uh, question from another language instructor. Thanks for the great Ooh. talk. This is Ashley Feta. I've been using CI novellas in class and the kids love them. Could you speak a little to what the reading portion of class after pre-reading looks like? This is where I keep feeling a bit lost in my own practice. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, this is this is the point where we all tend <laughs> to get lost. So this is what I've started doing. So in COVID times, because I'm not coming near anybody or like I'm, I'm not really talking in class because we're a hybrid. And so I'm just hiding behind my desk and just trying not to get COVID. But typically what happens is, is after the pre-reading, I'll just have them read it. I say like, hey, all right, give it a read. And if you hit something you, you, that you don't understand, just give it a go. Let me know. Just be like, hey, what's that? And I'll let you know what it is. 
And so I'll just have them read it and then they read on their own. And then afterwards, what I'll do is like, I'll project it on whatever, whatever medium possible. And I'll like read a paragraph and then ask some questions about it, you know, about what's happening or whatever have you. And we'll tend to go like that. But again, I think part of where I, I had a lot of missteps in the beginning with that part feeling weird is that sometimes the story is just the story and there's just not that much to talk about or they read it and got it and just kind of want to talk about just the content of it. So it, it's, I think it's giving yourself permission to not drag it. Sometimes you're like, yeah, we read it. We got it. So what's next? Versus like, well, no, no, we're going to spend seven hours asking questions about this one line. Like, there's not going to, you know, like, uh, and this is probably what a lot of people do at the beginning. And that's what I did. It was awful. We were like, uh, like, uh, I don't know. You like the, the woman has a hat. Um, does the woman have a hat? Yeah, yeah, she does. Um, what does the woman have? A hat. Uh, yeah, yeah, hat. Um, does a woman have a hat or a car? Yeah, a hat. Anyhow, moving on to the... Then if you're like, what are you doing? You know, you, those aren't questions. You don't want to know the answer to those questions. Why are you asking that question? Like, it's, not, it's so... Again, it's like, keep it as simple as possible and as quick as possible and focus exclusively on the content and questions you might actually want to know the answer to. Like, like what do you think? Like, what do you think about this? that kind of thing. I hope that helps. Yeah, someone, on a sort of related note, someone was wondering about how the pace changed when you moved to the CI method. Uh, they said, of course, I appreciate that it's better to have 80 students who get to unit three than eight students who get to unit 10. But how long do you have with students, how it develops? They said that they teach in a wildly different setup and pacing is a point of contention. Ah, okay. So, so for me, I have a huge amount of freedom and I work with somebody who I'm very much on the same page with in my department head and everyone that is so on board with what we're doing. So we focus everything on just very broad proficiency goals. So it'll be like, we would like our kids to get to like an intermediate interpretive reading um, level, which, basically, which is, you know, it's, it's, if you're teaching with a CI approach, it's pretty easy to get there. And we like that because it's super vague. So we can kind of just do what we want, which is just saying things in Latin and giving kids what they want. But that's my situation. Um, I have been in other situations where, you know, there people are in different places. They're on different things. There's things you have to do, like things like dealing with pacing or having to go through a specific textbook. So this is what I would, okay, this is what I would do. Again, yeah, figure out exactly precisely what the contention is, right? So say you're handing them off to another teacher. Ask that teacher, like what specifically, say, what is the first assessment that you give them next year? Like you have a copy of that. I want to make sure I'm getting them to where you want them to be. From there, you can say, okay, they want them to specifically be able to do x x x x and x that's what their actual concern is then from there you can kind of do what you want to do at what pace you want to do it at just knowing that they are going to want this very specific thing to happen so the more details you can find out about what they're looking for the better because once you have that for that one like end goal in mind even if the end goal is kind of poop and you're not thrilled with it it's, then you can say, okay, I can find a way to kind of cover the bases and, and, and get them there without feeling like I have to just abandon all the kids in the class, like who have been, you know, barred from, from language instruction beyond like year one for however long, right? So that's what, that mean, that's what I would do. Like I would find out exactly, very specifically, what is expected and then from there that'll give you more room to be able to um, maneuver and do things at your own pace and skip like five or six chapters if all they care about is like 
I want to make sure they can conjugate the uh, present tense. And be like, just skip all the other chapters and just be like, a, okay, yeah, last day of class. Hey, hey, here's a chart. Uh, here's a Quizlet set. Um, before the first day of school, just do that. And then I'm going to snap some pictures to make sure that the, I'm, not, I'm not joking. I literally did that. I literally took pictures of it. To, that was different situation, different situation. But hopefully that helps. Yeah, but will again, you take, that's great. Will you take one more question? I, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so I know that we're over time, um, but somebody was wondering how you approach teaching a long-winded Latin author like Cicero. Oh, so I don't. <laughs> so I just don't. So yeah, so this is a this comes into the category that I would say is um, would be. I might dance over to this would be in the category I would say of accessible goals and expectations in Latin in particular, we have come up with a set of goals, expectations that are so weird and impossible that we've developed an entire like separate discipline, which is just faking. Like we're able to do this stuff. I know I, that's what I did. I couldn't read Cicero when I was in school, like wonderful teachers, wonderful, absolutely professors. I, to this day, I swear, like are, are just absolutely unreal. But of course I, I couldn't read Cicero. Just like if, if English was my first language and I was in year three of learning English, I wouldn't be like reading Beowulf or like, or like the, I wouldn't be reading like speeches of Alexander Hamilton and being like, oh yes, yes. My name is Bob and oh yes, Hamilton. Yes, okay, give me this, yes. The Federalist Papers, so yeah, obvious next step. Yeah, yeah. So stuff like like Cicero is so outlandishly like out of where someone should be able to understand at that level. It's just it's it's ridiculous. But what you can do, though, what you can do is if you have to deal with an author like that or if you say or if you want to, if you're like, no, but there are parts of Cicero that I like that I want to teach. What I would do is, I mean, because we're interested in what they said, right? Like we're interested in what they said. So, so why not adapt it? Like make a simple version of like, okay, so Cicero goes on this long winded speech about like whatever have you, like 8,000 different ways to say Catiline's a bum and just like write a simpler version and be like, yo, Catiline, Catiline's a bum. And then like you can do that. Or the only other way I can think of to do that is just keep making simplified versions to get to the main version, but oftentimes that's not worth it. So that's what I would do is I just create like simpler versions of it and just kind of adapt it. Is, I mean, that's the approach that I would I would take in the end, ultimately. But if you're working with kids like, like way upper level who are way into that stuff for some reason, yeah, that's, I mean, I would, I would still end up just adapting everything to the best of my ability to get the idea out there. But yeah, hope that helps. Yeah, this is also great. Thank you so much, John. Um, if everybody could join me in thanking um, John Bracey, Magister Bracey, for talking to us today about um, how to make classics and especially language classrooms more accessible. Thank you for your time. There's a lot to think about here. Thank you so much.